I'm Dane Young with UGASports.com, as always with my friend Jim Donnan. And Jim, uh, from your media days at ESPN, we have uh, a guest from those circles. Bruce Feldman joins us on this episode of UGA Sports Live. Yeah, I used to know Bruce when he had holes in his shoes, but uh, now he's a big time uh, and uh, a good friend over the years. Uh, he was at ESPN, the magazine, when I was uh, working up there, and we had a chance to talk a little bit off camera and, and really developed a good friendship. And then over the years, an even better one. And uh, for our fans, they, they know his affiliation with the athletic and all he does writing, but he's also a very gifted uh, commentator for Fox Sports and does a great job with the uh, games, uh, you know, sideline reporting. And uh, Bruce, it's real thrill for us to have you on here. And I know our fans are looking forward to hearing from you. It's good to be on with you guys. Uh, I appreciate it, Coach. I appreciate the kind words. I value the, the friendship dating back to those ESPN days, which are now a long time ago. Um, but it's been it's been fun. And I mean, you were the, like, it's funny is I remember writing something about tennis play quarterbacks who grew up as tennis players, not knowing till, I don't know, probably after the ESPN days that you were the first. And then it was Drew Brees and Josh Rose. And I guess Mac Jones all followed your, followed your lead. Yeah. And uh, both of those guys are playing pro ball and I'm over here sacking sausage here. So uh, <laughs> here we go. But let's just talk a little bit uh, about the, uh, the last piece that you did. Everybody talks about, the, the transfer situation now, the uh, whether it's graduate transfers, immediate transfers, you know, underclassmen and all that. And certainly around the country, uh, there's a lot of impact guys. And we saw one a couple of days ago with the, the Tennessee kid going to Alabama. But you listed your, your top impact guys. And would you just uh, share those with our fans at this point? Yeah, the first one is one I think Georgia fans know pretty well, and that's Eric Gray. And he goes from Tennessee to Oklahoma. Uh, now, he's not Adrian Peterson ability-wise, but I talked to, for this story, I talked to both former coaches at Tennessee and the current coaches who work with him in Oklahoma. And honestly, sometimes you hear from some of the old coaches, you know, they'll be pretty brutally honest. And in the case of what I heard about Eric Gray was pretty glowing in terms of football junkie, really cares, good all-around back, will try to block. You know, not super dynamic, but has pretty good quickness and should be a really good fit in, in uh, Lincoln Riley's offense. And so, uh, you know, they like his short ear quickness, think he's got really good hands and good route runner and will be physical. And, you know, that's a really good offense. And so he's the first guy. Then there's a name that, you, you know, the fans on this podcast will know well, and that's Tyreek Stevenson, obviously a freaky athlete of Georgia, goes to Miami, saw that. A lot, Miami's had good success with guys getting, you know, new opportunities in different places. You know, certainly you had that with De'Ara King, the quarterback. You definitely had it with one of the best defensive players in the last draft, um, you know, and Jalen Phillips, who leaves UCLA, where his, his career was basically flatlined and goes to Miami and gets rejuvenated and buys in. And talking to the Miami defensive staff, they love what they saw from Tyreek Stevenson. They just thought that his confidence really carried through on the other secondary, which they thought was important in addition to just his physical tools. Um, and then you mentioned Henry Toa Toa from Tennessee goes there. And he's the guy to Alabama. He was the guy that Tennessee coaches could not say enough good things about in terms of work ethic, leadership physicality and they said you know he he will make sideline to sideline play so this is a case of the rich getting richer yeah that's for sure I mean the, they got the the one good linebacker already and then the, with Henry coming in there I, I, the question is ability to play on third down cover but you know he can certainly play sideline to sideline to run again how about the kid from West Virginia you got good ties up there you know that we, we picked up a kid at Georgia uh, the uh, defensive back what do you know about him yeah, he's a really good player. Now he's going to be more into the deep end of the pool, obviously, you know, in terms of, you know, big Big 12 defensive play versus SEC defensive play. But Tyke Smith, he comes in. He know Jamila Adai, who I think is a terrific addition for Kirby, Kirby's staff because I got to know Jamil a little bit. New, you know, last year going into the season, West Virginia loses their defensive coordinator. And basically he and Jordan Leslie, the defensive line coach, basically shared um, the DC job. And he did a, a, I thought he did a really terrific job there. 
you know, you bring over probably one of the two best players on that defense. Now he's going to jump in to Georgia. I don't know if I'd see him as necessarily like an all SEC kind of player, but I think he should be a really good player. He, he was number six on our list. Um, our number four guy is another name that Georgia fans will remember, and that's Jermaine Johnson, who was a good player and a deep position for Georgia. Now he goes to Florida State where um, that staff thought he might be the, the best defensive player they had in the spring. So he will definitely help uh, an FSU program that's – and they have, they have four guys on our top 50 list, including Mackenzie Milton. Obviously, everybody knows him from UCF. But they, you know, they've even taken a, a, you know, another transfer today. They have a bunch of transfers there. And I think in the case of – you know, if you're a Georgia fan, you're like Jermaine Johnson. Like, he was a good player. He wasn't like – you know, they didn't think he would be a great player, but sometimes these other programs where the talent is different, talent lag, and this is not the Bobby Bowden days or the Jimbo Fisher earlier days at FSU. I mean, this is a program that's basically six and six, seven and five-ish talent-wise, and so that that's a guy who can come in there and make a difference. Here's the thing about uh, Jermaine Johnson for our fans and for you. Uh, our system is set up with Kirby's, uh, playing these guys on the every down situation, not the nickel and dime thing where we really just have one defensive end, you know? And so you got Johnson trying to play with Nolan Smith and uh, a large G last year. And then, uh, you, you know, the fact we had Adam Anderson too. So, I mean, and we've lost Brendan Cox as, as a five-star transfer to Florida. So uh, we just don't, have, that's a one position where there's not two positions on the field for it's one. So, Sometimes you have to work your way in and play other positions like Anderson's playing some nickel now. And that's what happened to Johnson. He wanted to get more snaps. So uh, what do you got there, Dane? Bruce, I'm curious when you talk with administrators and coaches, are they more concerned with the roster management with the transfer portal or are they more concerned with the changes with name, image, and likeness? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think a lot, I don't want to, you know, it's a mix, but I feel like more coaches are concerned with roster management, because I feel like that is like a right now thing in terms of like, you know, you may see a lot of coaches say, you know, what, we're only signing 15 high school kids because we need to have space for 10 or so transfers. Because if you think about it, you know, old days, you know, old days could have been seven years ago, but like certainly, you know, when, when coach was at Georgia, you could develop offensive linemen. You know, a lot of teams take five and six offensive linemen and you're probably only going to hit on two or three of those. Well, even if the ones you hit on, maybe only one is going to probably play within the first year and maybe only two will be on the field in the first couple of years. So you got four other guys that maybe they're going to play four years from now and some of them may not play at all. Instead, now you can say if you're, a, a top power five program or even a mid-level power five program you say you know what i'm gonna sit and maybe we'll take the best offensive lineman in the mac or in the sun belt and you can come in here and play and be a guard like i'm trying to remember coach who was the lineman it's a guy we talked about a few years ago he was at i want to say south alabama and he was a guard he didn't have like NFL length, but he was like six one, three hundred strong. But he could come in and help somebody. You remember who I was talking about? It was like two or three years ago. I remember his cell phone son. Went That's what it is. That's what. Uh, yeah. Was, so you, so you take that guy. He helped him. He helped him. Yeah, you take that guy who has played three years. He's physically developed. He may not be a third, you know, a first or second day NFL pick. Maybe he's an NFL free agent camp guy, but he can definitely help you a lot more than some guy who may be 6'4", 270 or 6'5", 260. And you're hoping two years from now, he's going to be 300. But for the first two years, you're not probably getting anything out of that guy. And so, you know, a lot of these coaches know I better win now. I can't wait three years. So Dane on the NIL stuff, I think for the big coaches, like, and I'm not saying he's not in the, he's not in college football now, but let's say if you're urban Meyer, I think you cared more about NIL than you probably did uh, the transfer part. Because if you're urban Meyer, you're saying, well, this is affects how my culture is. Now I have to address, you know, what I think is a power balance that might be coming with what it used to be with coaches to now what it could become. 
and you're maybe dealing with third party people more than there's already third party people involved, but now it's like a bigger, you know, it's a bigger potential threat to them, I guess. So I do think for some coaches that is a, a, um, is a concern, but I just think for most coaches who know if I don't have my roster in the best shape possible this year and then next year, um, then that, that could cost me my job. Yeah. Talking about the national scene and the, and let's go over a couple conferences uh, from the standpoint of who could maybe make a move on, on these teams. Certainly, first of all, in the PAC 12 Oregon's right there. Uh, who do you see? Uh, we'll go from Oregon to Oklahoma and then Ohio state, and then we'll get into the sec, but those three, leagues there or who do you think the teams that maybe can threaten those I think Oregon has the best personnel on defense to make a move I don't know if Anthony Brown the quarterback from Boston College who I think is a pretty good player when he was healthy but not a not he's certainly not Justin Herbert they feel like the running back room is good I think Mario Cristobal has recruited well especially on the defensive side you look at their front seven it is a legit you know can match up with people and they have they have some good corners. So I think that gives them at least a chance, right? Um, I, again, I don't know if they have a good enough quarterback play to, to balance that out. Um, I would say them in the Pac-12, I think what's different for Oklahoma now than it was a couple of years ago, I do think Alex Grinch has been an upgrade in terms of, they were so underwhelming on defense, but especially in the secondary. Like I remember I did a bunch of Oklahoma games for Fox. And then I was around LSU when I was working on that LSU book. I was like, this is going to be a disaster when they play. Like I had just watched them smash LSU smash Georgia. And now I know those receivers and Joe Burrow are going up against a, a such an inferior secondary. And I think they could have beaten, they could have scored a hundred on, on Lincoln Riley's team that day. Now they've upgraded the secondary players in there, but that the, the margin to me was still like, they're, they're really, really good on offense, but you can't, you have to get some stops. And so now I think they at least have gotten a little better. Um, I just don't know if they've gotten enough because you got to remember, like I thought Baker and the level Kyler Murray were playing at, that's going to be a uphill climb for Spencer Rattler. Like everyone's saying Spencer Rattler could be a first pick in the draft or top 10 pick. And maybe that's the case. But um, you're banking on Lincoln Riley more than you're, you know, as much as anything, because it's like, okay, we saw what those guys did in his offense. I mean, if he's going to play at the level, and there's a big F of what Baker did and what, uh, what, uh, and what Kyler Murray did, then yeah, then the, if the defense is just, a, is just, you know, instead of the 90th best defense in the country, it's the 40th best defense. Well, if your offense is that great, then you have a real chance to win playoff games. If it's, if he's not as good as those guys, which again, that's a big ask, even if your defense is that much better, I think it almost balances out. Um, and then the third team you asked about coach, which is Ohio state. Like I'm not as sold on them. I'm not saying they're falling off, but I just think Justin Fields over, you know, like he made a lot of stuff go away. Like sometimes like I talked to some coaches in the, in the big 10 and there was a bunch of pressures that Justin Fields was so athletic. He got away from and made plays. The receivers are great. The whole receiving core, I mean, they have two first round picks out there. The tight end is tight ends are pretty good. I think their freshman running back Travion Henderson is going to be really good, but new quarterback. Now new quarterback is a big difference. And they lost four linebackers. I thought Pete Werner was a really good linebacker and the other guys played a lot. So now you're having almost a very new linebacker group. Your, ex, your secondary was not good. Like they got the benefit of the doubt until the playoff. And then people realize, Ooh, Sean Wade is not the guy that he was being hyped to be. So I'm saying all that. I just, I think of those three teams, I think they all have big question marks. Like I don't think going into this year, they're going coming out of last year. Ohio State to me was was the most talented of the three, but Ohio State now has to replace a quarterback who is the best, the most talented quarterback they've had, and they have to replace a bunch of key players on the defense. And they weren't that good on the defensive line for the first time in a while last year. So, you know, 
I, I don't know. I think it's I think it's a toss up to be honest uh, between any of those three. Well, you do a good job of analyzing that, and you go back to Oklahoma. Uh, the same thing happened at Oklahoma with Murray and with uh, Baker. They kept the offensive line and made them look a lot better with their ability to jump around. And I can guarantee you one thing. I told you this, and I'm going to say it again. What Caleb Williams, I mean, I know everybody's picking Rattler to do all this, but Caleb Williams, I'm going to say this in front of our fans here. We watch him. He, he's big time. But going on forward here, our first game is with Clemson, and that's why I let, I let that uh, be the fourth team. What do you see about that team that got beat by gave up 56 in their last game? I mean, that, was that just an anomaly, or how do you feel about the Tigers going into this season? You know, it's a great question. I'm so excited about that game. So that was the game where I think we saw Justin Fields at his best. You know, he he was showed he was tough. He made plays. He obviously did damage with his arm and his legs. And they have really really good receivers. The question on, on, on that is, um, are, you know, without George Pickens, are Georgia's receivers good enough to exploit what, you know, to take advantage of Venable's defense the way uh, Jamar Chase did? Jamar Chase abused a first-round pick for, for uh, Clemson in the national title game. We saw Ohio State's receivers do that. We saw Justin Fields do it. I don't know. You wouldn't. You guys would know this better than me. Whether Georgia's receivers are good enough. I mean, JT Daniels is a good quarterback. He's not going to make plays running the way certainly Justin Fields could. Um, you know, I think w one thing that has helped Clemson, and you know, was DJ Uyangalele actually got some real game time last year, not just in mop up. And I think that experience will help him. Um, I'm curious as how much drop off there's going to be without Travis ATN. Cause I feel like he was a little underrated to some degree, just because of the quarterback was so good with Trevor Lawrence. Um, you know, I, the thing that to me where Georgia has a chance to really make an impact, I, I don't know how good Clemson's offensive line really is. Right. And again, there, it wasn't like chase young was out there for Ohio state last year. So you know, Georgia has a Georgia has a lot of you know four and five star talent in their front seven. Can they get after this big six five, two hundred fifty five pound quarterback who can move and has a cannon for an arm? Can they unsettle him? If they can, um, you know, and I, I'm curious what answers you know those guys have for. You know, before Travis ATN, and they do a lot of stuff with RPOs where it was a lot of not that Trevor Lawrence needed any extra help, but that's an interesting matchup there. You know, so I want to see if, if Georgia can whip that Clemson offensive line. And I want to see, you know, how Georgia's receivers hold up against against, you know, a defense that they should have a chance to make some plays against downfield. Bruce, when we're talking about quarterbacks, you mentioned DJ Uwe Ungalale, and, you know, this is one of those seasons that you start looking at Heisman odds and things like that, and you're not seeing a whole lot of household names yet in college football. Who are the guys that, that the people that you talk to are talking about saying they're there, just hold on, we, we need to see tape of them? Because it's not like, I guess when you have a draft like you just had, it kind of removes some of that top-end talent, and we're waiting to see who emerged to, to replace it, right? Yeah, I, I'm sure there's some buzz for Bryce Young because he was a five-star guy out of high school and people love his dual threat capabilities. And obviously Alabama has had a track record now with their quarterbacks the last few years. Uh, now the, the two receivers are gone. John Mechie's still there. And we, you know, Jai Young looked really good in the spring game. But, you know, the offensive line was really, was, was the best in the country last year. They have some, some, some guys to replace. No Najee Harris, but I think that's an interesting one to, to keep an eye on. Um, you know, Sam Howell, everyone kind of knows he's probably one of the, the best known quarterbacks. I mean, it's been a while since I can't remember the last Heisman guy that that program had, though. Right. So Lawrence um, Taylor, probably. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, what's that? That's 40 years ago, and obviously yeah, a linebacker. To get in it, but uh, you're, yeah. you're right. But tell us about Malik Willis. I know you did a good story on him, and all our fans are, remember him at Auburn. He couldn't get on the field, but, uh, boy, you talk about a guy that 
from Georgia that's got a big time arm and athleticism. I mean, he he's he's lighting it up up at Liberty, isn't he? Yeah, and he, I mean, uh, for a, a scouting term, he's toolsy. He has a cannon for an arm, and he can really run. So I had worked on this draft story where I talked to a lot of NFL position coaches, and one of the things that came up. Um, a month or so ago was one of the coaches said, look, this isn't like last year's draft or the year before where you knew like last year, all right, we know Trevor's coming out. We know Justin Fields will be there. And we think Trey Lance may come out. That's two, maybe three guys we feel like have top 10 talent. This draft coming up for quarterbacks 2022, people are, aren't like, eh, I, I think there's a chance some people look at Sam Howell as that way, but it's like, People like Keaton Slovis, but they worry from USC, but they worry about his injury history. I think they still need to see a lot more from JT Daniels. I know there's some people who said top 10 pick, but I think, you know, from the people I talked to, did haven't, you know, seen it that way necessarily. But then you get into um, one of the things I heard was, well, the quarterback at Liberty is really dynamic and he's very, you know, like some of the scouts are like very intrigued by him. So, I had talked to the defensive coordinator at Coastal Carolina first and because they played him and he said, listen, we had a really good defense, I thought, and we beat BYU. They held Zach Wilson, the second pick in the draft, to 17 points. He goes, Malik Willis single-handedly beat us. He's got a cannon for an arm. You can't tackle him. He is such a good runner. He said, you know, he was so impressed by him. And then I talked to Tony Gibson, who's the defense coordinator at NC State, and he was like, I thought, you know, on film, he scared us to death. I thought we had a really good game plan. Now, so this is what they did. They gave him a lot of different looks. They dropped eight. They changed things up and they got him off balance a little bit. They were the only team that really gave him much problems this year. Now, I think Hugh Freeze does a really good job with quarterbacks in college. He did really well with Ryan Applin at Arkansas State, did well with Bo Wallace in the SEC. Um and this guy fits what they do with RPOs. He's dangerous, you know, as a runner. And they are, they have been, you know, his, his mechanics have gotten a lot better with Ken Austin, the OC there. I think the, the thing the NFL needs to see is how well does he see the field and some of the things that you won't necessarily see as staples of Hugh Freeze's offense that they're going to ask him there. He could be a guy somebody takes in the first round and goes, all right, hopefully we will not need to play him and we can bring him along in a year or two and then see we could have something special because the arm is the arm is special. He has a bigger arm than Trey Lance, who had the biggest arm in this draft. Now, he's only about six feet one. Maybe he's not even that. But we've seen plenty of quarterbacks now who are not more who are six one or shorter. It's the question is, you know, like, how does this game translate to the NFL, which is even if it's morphed a little more heavy RPO, it's still not like what you know, what we see a lot in college football these days. Yeah, that's a really good assessment of him. And I, I tell you, he, as you mentioned, Freeze has done a good job with him. And he's done a great job with that program. And we got a few minutes to go here. We're going to hit the uh, SEC now, and in particular the East, because uh, I think without question, Alabama's got everybody coming back and we, we get enough of that stuff from our local people. But just the, the perception that you, as a, a national guy, uh, what is your perception of Georgia at this point? Uh, of course, we're all fired up about a lot of things, but sometimes we know too much about it. But what do you think about the dogs and their chances this year? I, I think it's what what is the expectation, right? I think there are people who will have them as a top four team because they have loaded up on four and five star talent. I mean, it's it's as maybe with the possible exception of Alabama, and I'm not, I'm not counted the number of roster four and five star guys or five star guys, but outside of them, they probably have more than anybody. And so the expectation is, you know, when are they going to win a national title? That's how crazy high the bar is. I think what is, to me, what has hurt Kirby Smart a little bit is he was so close to winning a national title. And then the last three years, it felt like they have, I don't want to say backslid, but they've taken a little step back each year, right? So two years ago, they get blown out by um, LSU in the, in the Dome. And that's a good team. And I think they played a great team with a great quarterback. Last year, you know, they don't win the division. And, 
you know, look, I, I think it was a funky year to begin with because of COVID and you're bringing in a really different offensive coordinator who I think is a good offensive coordinator, but it's like new quarterback where Jamie Newman's in there, then he's not there. JT Daniels is, is, is trying to get healthy, but he's not all the way healthy. You know, Stetson Bennett did some good things. It wasn't like, you know, I feel like he probably got slammed a little bit you know, when, you know, there were moments where he looked, I thought he looked good against Auburn. I thought there were moments he looked good against Alabama, but um, you know, that to me, the challenges are the defense struggled in the two games where it really mattered and they faced great offenses and they, they struggled. I think this has got to be their year to, again, to at least if you are going to win the sec, let's start with that. To me, this is the best chance that they can have in that Florida has to replace a quarterback, has to replace the best player they've had in the program, at least since Tebow uh, in Kyle Pitts. They have to, you know, I don't know how good they are on defense. Like their defensive line was pretty suspect last year. I know they took two transfers in the middle of the defensive line. You look at Alabama, all the talent they have to replace. I mean, I know Alabama is still talented, but it's Nick Saban. This is probably, you know, you have a lot of new pieces all over the place. This is probably, if you're going to get them, this is probably the best chance to get them. And again, um, I don't know. I mean, to me, I think they're a top four team, but at this point, just as an outsider looking in, like I'm not believing it until they do it now. I think they're a really good team. I just, until they, until they can prove it, um, then I don't see them as a great team. I mean, I know Nick Saban's team can, can do it. I've seen Dabo's team do it. After that, it's like, I'm not, like I said, I'm not so sure on Ohio State this year. And then after that, you know, I'm uh, not the same thing, but like with Texas A&M, you got to find a new quarterback. You got to replace your offensive line. They're not at where Georgia is. But I just think like right now it's Alabama and Clemson are the givens. And I, I need to see it from Georgia to believe it. Bruce, you asked earlier about Georgia's wide receivers and could they do uh, similar things to what LSU did two seasons ago in Alabama last year? I'll just tell you, that's the question around here. Because when you look at the NFL draft, you're seeing Georgia offensive linemen get selected. You're seeing Georgia defensive linemen coming up in a couple of years, defensive backs had a run this year. The, the receiver question is the biggest one. How have you seen that change in college football where receivers have kind of become more prime than ever? I think that comes back to the offensive coaches, right? So um, Joe Brady made a huge impact, not just uh, helping as a play caller and, and implementing this versions of the Saints offense, but I thought helping coach those receivers. I mean, that was a amazing trio he had, but also the tight end and the running back, Clyde Edwards, Hilaire were big factors of that offense. Um, you look at, at Georgia, one of the things I heard about Munkin from coaches who worked with him, they thought he was great working with receivers. And so I, as you guys know, it wasn't like there's a ton of experience in that room last year, right? And again, disjointed off season. So it's hard, you know, like I would give people a pass on last year, especially if you had a new staff. But, you know, I think there's opportunity there for, for JT Daniels to really spread the ball around. It's just now you lost what was the number one receiver, a sure go-to guy the tight end is a matchup nightmare I think there's some you know some intriguing options there but that's the part where you, know, you look at what Ryan Day has done there he has a really good his Brian Hartline's a receivers coach he's been a great recruiter for him he played in the NFL he comes from that program he's been able to sell it they have got a pipeline in on receivers and I think like I said they have two first round picks and a guy that they that just transferred out of there because he wasn't getting the ball enough may end up starting at Alabama this year so that's kind of shows you what they have. Um, you know, you, you see it where certain programs all of a sudden now, I feel like they know, hey, if I go there, um, Oklahoma has a really good run of receivers. They're different types of receivers, whether it's Hollywood Brown or C.D. Lamb. You're seeing different kinds of guys going there because they know what Lincoln Riley does offensively. I think that's the, that'll be interesting is if, Georgia has the year that a lot of people think they have it. They may be able to have, which is they can be a playoff team. They could maybe make a run in a national title. 
it's not to say that they're not getting good receivers now because obviously Pickens was was really good um and Burton was a you know was a big you know get he was committed to LSU and then he ends up there but I think it's something where you know LSU had talented receivers I felt like on you know there was a one year where Cam Cameron had it rolling with with Mettenberger and obviously Landry and Beckham but now it feels like after the Joe Joe Brady time there you know that not only helped get those guys but then all of a sudden they get Kayshawn Butte, who be, you know becomes a future All American, I think you need to have that kind of momentum going. Just like Alabama, until Julio, it felt like they were really underwhelming a receiver. Now all of a sudden, you look at the run of receivers they had there. I mean, it's hard to even keep track of the sequence. It goes from Julio to Ridley to Amari Cooper to like a couple other guys. I should be I shouldn't be forgetting before you get into the last four. It's it's Judy, it's Ruggs, it's Devontae Smith, it's Waddle. Um, you know, I feel like that's the thing that I don't want to say that needs to happen necessarily at Georgia, but I think that's the part where, you know, if you throw the ball 26 times a game, it's harder to probably do that. Or if you throw it 28 times a game, as opposed to 40 times a game, but you, you know, it's an interesting philosophical thing. The thing's going to have to happen for Georgia is how good is the defense going to be to get the stops where, you get more snaps on offense, you know, where your, your offense can, you know, we're going to be pretty good running the ball for sure. But, you know, with without Pickens, how these guys step up. But in the last few minutes we got here, Bruce, uh, just give us an idea of what you do uh, for your uh, program there when you're on the, the, the uh, morning show on Sunday, on Saturday, when you go on there, all the prep you have to do, what, you know, the, the everything that goes into putting that show together which I think is among the better ones, uh, studio shows of, of any sport. Yeah, Y'all do a great job with it. Well, I appreciate it. Um, so we start out, we have a Monday call and on, you know, it's usually around lunch and it's about an hour just to kind of kick around what we think is coming down the pipeline. We also talk about the games um, that are either going to be on our air and also the big games of the week and what we want to cover. And then we kind of work towards, you know, I, I work towards talking to coaches and players related to that. Uh, and then Friday, we, you know, everybody's in town in LA where we meet and we have a couple hour afternoon meeting and then they will, uh, we'll rehearse a bunch of stuff. And then I have a 4am cause we're on the West coast and it's a, we go on air at seven. I have a 4am wake up on Saturday mornings and I usually get into the studio by 445 and we hit rehearsal at six. Now what this past year was, was obviously chaotic was there was so much stuff that happened. I remember driving into the studio for our, our meetings on Friday and we were going to have a Baylor Houston game on our air the next day. And in the car ride there, somebody texted me saying that game is going to be off. And so I called somebody on site and they explained to me that we're going to announce it in, you know, whatever, an hour or something. But like all of a sudden you're doing a complete 180. you know, that's going out. Like the, the, this isn't surreal or anything, but I, the day, one of the days I remember the clearest was um, basically we were going in to, to talk about, you know, a couple of things that were completely, you know, I, I worked on the night before and then Saturday morning comes and I get a text, the Florida state Clemson game is off. And it just kind of like blew up that morning because of a COVID uh, issue. And so I'm on the phone with some sources at FSU and then I'm getting texts from people at Clemson. And so I'm talking to our producers and it was like, whatever, I think we started to audition at 6 a.m. or 6.03 completely was different because from like 6.15 to 6.50, I was on the phone with people and that completely changed what I had in the show in our A block, which is like, for me, I would be in the A block. Um, you know, usually it's somewhere between 7.02 or seven oh somewhere between oh two and seven oh seven in the morning, and then come back. Like I would have another segment with with Brady Quinn, where it was like just a back and forth about games, and then later in the eight o'clock hour, it's again similar to the kind of the news of the day, but it just changed so much because of everything was on the fly. I remember, um, you know, reporting early on, and this was good for us at the time in terms of was like talking about how there's momentum in the Big Ten about coming back to play. Well, I was on the phone all. Friday night, you know, I know I have a 4 a.m. wake up call. I was on the phone with somebody for like an hour, 20 minutes. I could not get off the phone Friday night till like 1130 my time. And I'm thinking I got to get up early. 
really, but I knew that was the story we're going to be talking about. Right. And so sometimes you don't know, like also we're coming on game college game day is on and that's definitely a competitor for ours. And that's a good show. They're, they're on an hour before us. And so we had the red river game, the Texas OU game. And I had gotten a tip that uh, the leading rusher for OU was not going to be able to play in the game. And so I'm thinking, I heard about it Friday at, around dinner time, And I'm like, there's no way this news is going to stay news. But by the time we come on air now, fortunately for me, it did stay news, but it's like, you're constantly kind of evaluating what's going on. And then you, because of COVID you'd also have, you know, somebody was going to announce like an hour before kickoff, you know, nine starters aren't playing the game because of like COVID protocols or somebody tested positive or whatever, or quarantine. And that was just, that was just kind of how it became. It became the, the abnormal became the normal. Last question from us for you, Bruce, because I've been asking Mac Brown. I asked uh, a few different other guests that we've had. How did you get to know coach Don and tell me about your relationship with him? Yeah, I, I honestly don't remember the first in-person meeting we had. I think it was, I don't think it was in Bristol. I feel like it was somewhere else, but um, you know, it's, here's this hall of fame coach who, you know, I remember I'd be lying if I said, I remembered him from his OU days. I definitely remember him from his Marshall days. And um, you know, it was one of those things where I, you don't know. And I don't know if you would see this Dane or not, but I was like early on, I'm like, I don't know if he likes me or not. Because, <laughs> You know, I've had this conversation with a couple of people where it's like, I think because, you know, he's got a little bit of a presence to him and it's like, you, you just don't know. And then all of a sudden it was like, man, um, to coaches credit, like there's a lot of people who are former head coaches who end up in TV and they don't do the work in terms of like, for whatever reason, they stop talking to people who are coaches and they stop talking to people in the industry. And I know, you know, that this is the opposite about him because, you know, there's a lot of times we say, Hey, I'm hearing this or whatever. And it's not necessarily just in the sec. It could be all over, you know, the big 12 it could be some other places. And I mean, I don't want to, you know, say other names of other coaches that I've worked with on the TV side, but it's like, I remember there's times you thinking and like, Hey, you know, you know, these guys, I'm not saying you have to like, before we go on the air on something, you should be calling them and saying, Oh, I talked to Johnny Smith and he told me X, Y, and Z, but like, that's information that like, you don't have to break news, but you should be at least informed on like, what do people really think about this, you know, this player, this matchup, this, whatever. And so I, I mean, I think it's just kind of, you know, I love college football. It's all I cover all year round. And I mean, I know coach has some other interests, but like, I know that he's a football junkie in that part of it. And so that was kind of the bond, how it grew from there. So um, it was neat. I do remember, like I said, going to his house um, before a game that I was in, in Atlanta for. And, you know, just kind of like, just to kind of see him in his habitat of the football cave um, on a Saturday. So, I mean, I think we kind of bonded by that and it kind of grew over the years. And it's, it's cool because that was one of the cool things about ESPN. You get to, you get to be at a table with like legends, you know, and, you know, sometimes the legends were great players and that's where they left it and maybe, you know, maybe they had other interests or maybe they just, you know, soured on the game and everything, but coach, obviously, you know, he wouldn't be doing this podcast with you if he didn't, you know, really, really care, you know, about it and still about it. So that's, that's the thing that, you know, I mean, that I'm grateful for the friendship and for the, just the bond that was grew out of football. Well, we appreciate that Bruce. And you know how I feel about you and your family and certainly, uh, our fans know my biggest deal with the podcast is try to back Kirby, a guy that played for me, and do all we can to support Georgia. But you certainly gave us a great insight into the national scene and, the, uh, you know, what it's like to cover all these guys. And I know all our fans really look forward to 
listen to your podcast with Stuart Mandel. And, uh, you know, that's one of the best in the country. And uh, I've been on it a couple of times and, and also all the stuff that you put out and uh, just keep it coming. And maybe you get to go to the, are you going to get to go to the Georgia Clemson game or are you going to be doing something? I would fun? like, I don't know yet if I'm in Stuart or not, but that is, I mean, just when we talk about it, you know, like here, it's sitting here, you feel like, I mean, I'm, I've told coaches like I'm now coaching first grader football, you know, cause our season is now and I'm coaching baseball and we have all this stuff going on now. And it's, it's like, Hey, we're getting close, close to feeling like back to normal. And the idea of these games, we're talking about these matchups. Um, it's kind of like, it's, it's like invigorating, right? Cause we're getting closer. I'm excited. That sounds like we're going to have media days cause that we're getting closer, you know? And so, um, you know, it's like, let's keep our fingers crossed and keep, keep going in the right direction. All right, Bruce, we'll be uh, keeping up with you. And I know our fans love uh, listening to you and uh, appreciate it so much. My pleasure, guys. Enjoy talking football with you.